the thing that we're going to talk about today, of course, is, is how we build on the relationships that are personal, the relationships that are economic, and the relationships that we need to develop in order to ensure strategic infrastructure corridors. So I'm going to actually take a step back, and I'm not going to focus at, as much on specifically what we're doing at Centreport Canada, although I will give you a flavor of that towards the end of my presentation. But I'm going to talk, and just picking up from the last, uh, the working breakfast on transportation policy this morning, talk about why strategic infrastructure corridors within our continent are so important, and some of the trends that are driving this, and why we need to act now, and what we're doing in Canada um, as part of our share on that and what at Centreport means in terms of the overall North American connectativeness and for business on supply chain management. So just as a starting point, I think all of us know and took important lessons from the global recession. And business did as well, of course. And some of the lessons that were taken from the recession included uh, the fact that the world is much more interconnected at this point in history than it ever has been before. So for a company in New York State, for example, you, you may be as likely to be competing with a company from Singapore or India as you are from a company with a company from Seattle. So the world is much more interconnected and we're finding that has profound implications for how we manage our supply chains, how we ensure our companies are competitive. We also know that in order to compete in an intensely global, globally competitive environment, we have to lay the groundwork and the infrastructure for business to prosper. Companies need to be able to manage their supply chains in the most cost-effective, time-efficient way possible, and that means access to high-quality infrastructure to do so. Business tells us that differentiation, ensuring they can differentiate themselves globally is important. Predictability in terms of policy, so the policy environment in which they're acting, and efficiency in terms of transportation corridors and networks are all critical to the way they plan and look and outward on their business. And then finally, all of these, as we know, have consequences to what as policymakers, as governments, and as business do in terms of improving the North American infrastructure environment. And I, I think in this a real flavor of this conference here at the CSG is the importance of NAFTA. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but this NAFTA has had important important consequences for our region. Trade has tripled on our continent since NAFTA came into force. More than one in five jobs are linked directly to NAFTA and that's across all three countries. But we cannot forget that as a region, our importance is actually becoming diminished relative to other global trading blocks in the world. And so we've been spent a lot of time, I'll call it, resting on our laurels when it comes to the NAFTA environment. When in fact what we should be looking is how we can reinvigorate and attract and onshore jobs within our continent rather than be focused on what's going on in terms of protectionism with China and other places. There's other trends that are happening while we have been standing still, and that is global trade continues to grow. Um, trade has grown by more than 730% over the last 30 years. Right now, global trade accounts for $20 trillion of economic activity in the world. $20 trillion. Major exporters and importers currently, the United States, Germany, China, Japan, France. Well, what's going to happen by 2050? Well, we know right now the so-called BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and other developing economies, are, their populations are growing faster than that, that of North America, and their economies are growing faster than that of North America. So we're seeing a trend where in not that long period of time, their economies are going to be more than 150% the combined economies of the G7 countries. So there is a lot of changes that are going on in the global environment right now that have direct implications for how we look at jobs here 
on our continent. Now, this shows the trends of within, our, within North America and how trade has grown between 2001 and 2010. And you can see exports out of Canada, the United States, and Mexico grew to all three countries within our region. But look at what exports have done to China. To Canada's trends to China, 366% increase in growth. United States exports to China, 377% increase in growth. Mexico's exports to China, 990% increase over those nine-year period of time. So even within our region, export trends are changing, which has implications for infrastructure when you look at where our exports are going, which creates jobs here at home. We also, as we look at what's going on with freight, we also need to know, too, what's happening with passenger movement because border traffic impacts passengers as well. And I thought this was a really interesting statistic. Right now, about 22 million Canadians live within 62 miles of the border. That number was chosen because it equates to 100 kilometers, which is the, the language which we think in in Canada. But 12 million also live along the southern border of, uh, and both sides of the U.S.-Mexican border. So there's a significant number of border populations that are either cross the borders frequently, if not daily. In fact, it, last year, 30 Americans crossed the Canadian border every minute. So it, there is a lot of activity between our countries all the time. And all of this growing trade has created congestion. We heard about that this morning. Some interesting statistics. The U.S. Highway Administration estimates that by 2040, freight movements across all modes will grow by the more than 61%. Now, why does that matter? Well, because the U.S. Department of Transportation says, basically, that freight railways are already maxed out in the United States and that there's going to have to be a nearly 90% increase in capacity in order to accommodate that. The fastest growing type of transportation in the United States is intermodal traffic, which operates on freight railways. You know that has positive implications for green, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but there's not at the capacity to be able to handle that right now. And there is a cost to congestion. There is a business cost and there's a greenhouse gas emission cost to congestion. In Canada, it's estimated between $2.3 billion and $3.1 billion. But look in the United States. In the United States, it's billions in dollars of total congestion costs. LA, Long Beach area, almost $11 billion, resulting in over 520 million uh, hours of de delay. Just even look at Seattle. Now, these are numbers that affect the bottom line of consumers. They affect the bottom line of business. And they're, they're real. These are numbers estimated by the Texas Transportation Institute. Now, what we're doing in Canada um, is that we've been investing in what we call strategic infrastructure. Uh, led by the Government of Canada, they put in place the Building Canada Fund, which was $33 billion uh, in funding, and they augmented that by other funding for the Asia-Pacific Gateway, borders and gateway crossings, um, as well as green and other related transit infrastructure. And you can see across all of the network of roads and rail in southern Canada, there's been significant expenditures that have been happening. And this is to allow not only streamlined movement to and from our ports, but also to create value-added jobs and activity inland, like in places like Winnipeg, Manitoba. So what we're doing at Centreport is creating a 20,000-acre inland port. It's adjacent to our capital city of Winnipeg, Manitoba. It's managed by a private sector corporation, which I'm the CEO of. And our mandate is to develop the inland port. It is to act as a one-stop shop for business investment activity, to make it as easy as possible for business to do business. And it's to market the, the inland port. So what we do is we connect the dots for business to needed infrastructure, to transportation assets, 
to governments for regulatory and other approvals, and to land developers and real estate brokers. And all of this is to help differentiate what we're doing and connect business to do value-added activity, create jobs and economic wealth in our community. Now, why an inland port? Well, inland ports provide unique advantages to business because it allows them to manage their, cost, their uh, supply chains in a cost-effective way. There's a logistics advantage. And the logistics advantage comes from enhanced infrastructure, increased supply chain visibility, and a company's being able to control the full length of its logistics process. But it also has improvement for supply chains. And that includes everything from improved delivery times, proximity to customers, uh, you know, being able to control those issues, as well as reduce transportation costs and congestion. Now, for those of you who don't know, and are wondering why we're doing this in Winnipeg, Manitoba, that some of you may have ver barely heard about. Well, look at our geographic location. Winnipeg, Manitoba is at the very center of the country of Canada. But what few people in this room know is that Winnipeg is also in the very center of North America. Because what we forget about is that great white north, with two-thirds of the population of Canada living along the Canada-US border. And that great white north has $20 billion in oil and gas and mining exploration and development taking place right now. It is the last untapped frontier for those type of economic resources. And Winnipeg, connected by the port of Churchill into the Arctic, is the only inland deep sea port within the center of the country connected by rail to center port. So our location matters because we are at the eastern end of the Asia Pacific Gateway connected by the ports to Prince Rupert, Canada's newest port, and the port of Metro Vancouver, Canada's largest port. We are also at the western end of the Atlantic Gateway connected by the port of Halifax to reach markets in Europe and India, as well as the port of Montreal. We are at the northern end of the so-called NAFTA gateway, which runs down the spine of the United States, connecting I-35 and I-29 up, up to Winnipeg. Connected to the ports of New Orleans, Houston, Los Cardinals, and Mexico. And all of that by rail infrastructure, not just by trucks. So we have a unique geographic lo location advantage that's also augmented when you look at how far you can reach within a guaranteed 24-hour distribution coverage. Because as we know, customers now want, are demanding, not just even expecting anymore, demanding just-in-time delivery. The black inner, inner semicircle is the guaranteed 24-hour transshipment distribution coverage out of Winnipeg. It covers Chicago, it covers Minneapolis, St. Paul, Kansas City, Montana, the Dakotas, parts of Western Canada, all the way almost to Toronto in uh, Eastern Canada. The green semicircle at the bottom is the guaranteed 24 or 48 hour transshipment distribution coverage. And you can see that covers all of continental United States. So when you're trying to reach key customers, your geographic location again matters. Now what we're doing in terms of logistics and infrastructure is we're building unique platforms. We are a tri-modal inland port and by that I mean we're connected to three class one rail carriers, CN, CP, Burlington, Northern Santa Fe, all from our inland port. A competitive rail environment is one of the best ways to drive down transportation costs. We've seen it happen for customers and investors already. We also are a significant trucking center. The governments of Canada and Manitoba have invested $212.5 million to build a new expressway in and out of the inland port. Why? Why are we building this infrastructure when the inland port is only two years old? Because we're looking ahead to the future and knowing that if we don't address growing commercial traffic needs now, that commercial traffic will put increased pressure on residential streets and that's going to create problems in the medium and long term. We also are a very busy cargo airport. 
Winnipeg has the most dedicated cargo freighter flights of any airport in the country of Canada. Those are the flights like UPS, Cargo Jet, Purolator, FedEx that fly cargo only activity. And our central location in Canada makes that difference for us. Along with the fact that our airport is a 24 hour, uh, 365 day a year protected and legislation facility. And really what we're doing is looking also to the key things that business needs to do business. Strong infrastructure platforms are part of it. Ease of access to regulatory programs is another piece. We are a foreign trade zone offering single window access and facilitated access to the federal foreign trade programs like Customs Bonded Warehousing Facility. So products on, that are at congested ports do not have to clear customs there. They can come directly into center port and be cleared there. We also are working with the Government of Canada to promote the fact that our country is eliminating tariffs on manufacturing inputs. And this is a big regulatory change within our country that has significant beneficial impacts for our manufacturing environment. By eliminating tariffs on the inputs from manufacturers, they can produce a lower cost, more competitive manufactured product. We also um, are working to fast track land development approvals. We've created a new administrative body that allows, that takes the small p politics out of, out of straightforward, non-variance land development decision making. Those development decisions can be pre-approved. And then finally, we're a tax increment financing zone. Governments are using this tool to be able to estimate what the value of taxes will be generated out of our de development and borrow against it to build the necessary infrastructure. Ultimately, we are focused on export-oriented, trade, value-added type of investment activity at Centerport. We do not see ourselves as an inbound distribution center for a local domestic population. We're really focused on manufacturing and assembling and export oriented activity. And that is what distinguishes this project, creates that value added jobs that will help our region thrive into the future. Thank you very much.